meeting to order. This is Wednesday, February 1st, 2023. I do want to announce that um, we did have originally planned a closed session item, um, but it has been rescheduled to February 15th, 2023. Um, so we did not meet in closed session earlier this evening. Uh, and I do want to say we did receive one email uh, regarding uh, um, our closed session. So that was received and we'll carry that into our uh, future closed session uh, at a future meeting on the 15th of February. So with that being said, uh, Madam Clerk, if you would call our regular meeting, I mean, uh, call roll for our regular meeting, please. Council Member Dinez. Here. Council Member Estrada. Here. Council Member Sobeck. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Carwin. Yes. And Mayor Zimmerman. I'm here, thank you very much. I know that Pastor Rocky Stone is here with us. He's with Sandals Church. Rocky, if you don't mind coming to the podium and uh, helping us with some words of inspiration to help set the tone for tonight's meeting. Wonderful, thank you for having me here. It's always a pleasure to get to spend an evening with you guys every couple months. I was talking with Mayor Zimmerman earlier, uh, 10 minutes ago. I've had the uh, opportunity to live in many different cities and states throughout my military career and just have been so impressed uh, with the city of Menifee. Um, just constantly reminded as I look at the different places that I've lived of what a great experience my family, my children, our church have here. Um, just a, a blessing to be in this community and to be a part of it. Um, I know that there are many different things on your agenda that you have to speak about and talk about and, and many decisions you have to weigh as you consider the life of our community and what's best for each people. Um, I know I am uh, really looking forward to that Holland overpass uh, someday. I keep hearing about it, so I'm, I'm really looking <laughs> forward to that coming someday. Um, but I, I just want to say I, I'm, I'm just really proud of our community uh, for the life that we create for the citizens here, um, for the opportunities that we give to people, and, and just for the climate that is the city of Menifee. Um, there are so many other places that really struggle with a lot of strife and, and difficulty and a lot of... Uh, just community tension. And, uh, and as a member of this community, I, I haven't felt that. I've just felt, uh, just really enjoy living here and being a part of it. So with that, I'd love to pray over this session uh, and let you guys get going. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, thank you so much. Uh, Lord, that we get to live, that we get to work, that we get to be a part of this community. Um, God, I pray over our city leaders, Lord, the, the mayor, mayor pro tem, city council members, city manager, the city staff, um, God, that you'd give them wisdom. Lord, not just as they make decisions that impact our lives, but as they carry out their everyday day-to-day -day duties, um, God, that they would always have in the forefront of their minds, uh, Lord, the citizens of this community, the opportunity they've been given uh, to serve and to lead us, God, and that you would give them wisdom to lead well. God, would you bless their efforts and their work? God, would you be with them as they make decisions and have conversations? And God, would you go before them, uh, Lord, in these negotiations and conversations as they deal with vendors and different projects and many things that are coming up in our city? God, would you give them favor? Would you give our community favor? God, and would you allow Menifee to continue to flourish and, and be a, a great, safe place for families, uh, for people to live? Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Pastor Stone. We appreciate you. We appreciate your congregation as well here in Menifee, and I know there's good things ahead. So, um, all right. So with that, we are now on item four, this Pledge of Allegiance. And if I could ask uh, Mr. Michael Cano, who's here, he's one of our Measure DD Oversight Committee members and also uh, the commander of VFW 1956, if you'd lead us in the flag salute, sir. Right. Thank you, Mr. Cano. We are now on item five of presentations. Our first presentation is the City of Menifee app. Uh, and if Mr. Puccinelli is ready to go, hopefully. Yeah, Ron, do we have uh, our PowerPoints up and going? Yes. Please. Okay, good. Hey, Ron, just so you know, the, the, the pastor was feeding back a little bit into that microphone. Thanks.
Thank you, Mayor and City Council. Forgive me for being a little bit frazzled right now. We just had a major hiccup that we finally got everything back. So staff, all your presentations are good. We're good for tonight. <laughs> um, thank you for the opportunity. A little while back, um, Council Member, or Mayor Pro Tem Carwin asked us uh, through the police department to put together something in the Menifee City app that would help us with reporting potential homeless encampments and things like that. And we're here to close that loop to show you how this works um, and, to, and to just give you a quick demonstration. We're not gonna touch every single feature, every single function, um, just take maybe three to five minutes. And I'd like to introduce Amber Stout, who is our newest IT analyst. This is her work. Um, so we're very proud of what she's done. She's done a great job on it. So we're gonna start off on the website because there's two ways to report issues to the city. First one is the website, and then we have the app on the phone. And the, the website will also show you how to get the app loaded on your phone. So with that, I'll let Amber drive for us. If we have the website up, please. So on the website, um, the way you can report the issue is if you hover over Get Connected, um, First, you would actually, to down, get the instructions to download the app for your phone, you can actually go to the official Menifee, official Menifee app page. And then here, um, there, it gives you a brief overview of what the app is about. And on there is a link where it says, please click here. When you click on here, it actually opens up as a PowerPoint um, for you guys to go follow through step-by-step step on how to um, download the app. If we go back to the website and however get connected again, you can actually click on report an issue. And this will bring you to um, the page where you actually select which issue type that um, you wanna report. So for, the, for Council Member Carwin, we actually added three new um, subtypes, which would be law enforcement, homeless encampment, and we actually redid our code enforcement subtype to make it um, easier to use and more user friendly. If we click on law enforcement, here you can see it laid out by the map, you can add a description, but under subtype is where you get all the different categories. If we click on subtype, you can select which category it would be. If we click on like crime tip hotline, it will actually show you where you can, um, who to call by dialing that number. And if we click back out, you, and select uh, like the general law enforcement issue types. This would be for like categories of just general issues that we might see not, if there's not a category for it, this is where you would put it. For this test, we'll do a um, city council test. And then you can um, actually either enter the address if you're certain where the address is at, or on that map, you can move the blue um, pin around and zoom in and out of that map to an actual location that you want. And as you can see, once you move that pin, the address will actually update for you. And then if you scroll down, you can actually attach files. So if you took any photos, have any documentation that you wanna add to this um, issue, you can select files and then it will add it. And then at the bottom, we're gonna have you um, fill out your information so that way whoever receives this report knows who to contact. I'll give them a minute to finish. So once you submit the report, you'll actually get a notification um, just informing you about how your case was submitted. And then from there, we're actually gonna go back to actually viewing the homeless. So under homeless encampment, we actually added one category um, as an issue type. So if we could click on subtype for the possible encampment. So what this will do is when they select all these ish subtypes, it will actually, when you submit the report, we'll send it back to um, the designated staff that are in charge of these um, issues as well as the department so that way they know who who to send it out, for example, for homeless encampment, this will actually be going to our code enforcement team. So then they can send out an officer um, to look at what's going on in these areas. And then we're gonna um, view it from the app portion. So while, while we're doing the magic switch here of plug and unplug, um, 
we're trying to make this as, as easy for, for our residents to contact us and let us know what's going on. There's been a lot of other um, minor cleanup and wording changes and things like that, making sure we have the correct staff listed. Um, so this, this app is ready to roll now um, and will be, will be available. So we'd like to now switch and show you um, on the screens and for the people watching at home, the actual phone app of how you would go through and do this. And there's a really cool thing where Amber was showing you like the crime tip line. You can actually just dial that well by hitting that button there. So can I just Amber, ask you real quick before you move on, where does the homeless encampment report go? Who receives that? With that goes to our police department. It starts with our code enforcement and they will route it to either um, the homeless liaison officer or anybody else that they, they deem as appropriate to that. So on the app, the first thing um, the public would want to do is actually get signed in on the app. So to sign in on the app, where the three lines are at the very top right hand corner, is right where my name is, you would actually get a sign in option. There, just like on the website where I had that contact form, it will be the same information, your name, email, and phone number that you would fill out. So that way when you submit these on the phone, it also knows which email to, when you submit your case to, like when you get that notification back, it will send it back to your email as well as for the staff to know who to contact. So we made it pretty easy where the report the issue is actually on the home page of the app. You don't have to go searching around. So when you click on report an issue, it's a little different viewpoint. Instead of it being side by side, we just made it as a drop down. And then at the bottom, you'll see where homeless encampment and law enforcement icons are located at. So as Ron was saying, for the crime tip hotline and the narcotic hotlines, these will allow the residents to select these, when they select these icons, um, to click on it, and then it will pop up with this feature to call. When you actually select call, for iPhone users, it's down at the bottom. Um, for Android users, it does take you to your actual phone page to hit that dial. And then it'll dial right away. And then for the same process for when you're submitting one of the other reports, you, you would select um, the address that you want, you're reporting the incident at. You can actually zoom in and out, as well as move the map around to that exact location that you're looking for. You would hit next at the bottom, add your notes, and then if you want to choose a picture, you, you could choose it from your files or take a photo. And then you just hit done and submit at the bottom and you'll get that same report as well as you can review your report or create a new report right away. Thank you, Amber. So in, in a nutshell, that's how this app works. And obviously it works very similarly for all the other issues that, um, that residents can report to us um, and we, we will respond. That's why we ask for your contact information so that you get the acknowledgement as staff works through the issue and addresses the issue, you will get the notifications that it's been done or it's in process and those kinds of things. So uh, that concludes our presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions or get out of your way. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Carwin's in the queue. Thank you. First of all, excellent, excellent updates. Uh, that's really going to help our citizens and also help us collect data on <coughs> where these things are happening. Uh, when I noticed, I, I have the app and I don't see those new features on there. When are those going to be updated for use? This evening and overnight. So in the morning, you should be able to get a new refresh and have it there. All right. And do you have a slide by any chance that shows the correct icon from the the app store? So people know which one it is, because you, you showed how to get it from the website, but if you're on your phone and you go there, which one it is? Um, I honestly don't know off the top of my head, so I'm not going to make <laughs> up an answer. But if you check the, if you're going to your phone and you go to the website and get that, that little instruction sheet, it does have all of that there. Okay. It just, it, it says City of Menifee though, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Councilman Dinas. Thank you. Real quick, when, when someone's using the app, and they're at the location they're reporting on, can the app pick up that location mm -hmm. and so they don't have to worry about finding Correct. it on the map? Okay, good, that's yeah. all I had, thanks. Yeah, it, we just let you move it around if you're, if you're standing in front of your house and you wanna report you know, six blocks away or whatever it might be. 
And I'll just say I'm really pleased that you guys have upgraded this and made it easier for people. Um, the council members get an awful lot of um, emails and phone calls about things like potholes or graffiti or a homeless encampment and or people put it on social media and, and say, hey, look, shame, shame. It's so much easier. If you want it fixed, this is the best way to go directly to the people that are going to fix it and bypass the middle folks, which is us. So uh, I see Councilmember Sobex in the queue. Thank you. Um, this is a great update, and so I appreciate Councilmember Carwin bringing this, the homeless encampment sp specifically, and the graffiti, because that's been something. Um, is it, so how important is it for a resident to report this on the app versus, say, calling one of us or reporting it on Facebook or, Twi you know, on the neighborhood app. Could you tell us how much important this is to use the city app? I can certainly try, council member. Um, I think mayor said it best this gets you directly to the people who are going to be working on the issue um it's kind of like when you want to you know place your order at wendy's you don't call taco bell and then have them call wendy's you go to wendy's and and place your order same thing here if you want the city to do something tell the city that we need to do something because you're the eyes and ears out there we're not always out there this is by far the fastest way to, to get that to get yeah. action and when you say fastest way, if someone was to report <coughs> graffiti, is there a time frame that should be taken care of? Um, I know there's a difference between public and private property. Yes. I'm actually going to have to look to Nick Fiddler, our public works director, for that particular one. That's not my area of expertise. I think that would be a good uh, example. You know, I can, I can give you a, a real-time example. I was walking to get my car, and it was about a half a mile walk, and I encountered a crack in the sidewalk. And I whipped out the app, took a picture of it, and sent it in, and I got a notification that it was assigned, and the next day it was fixed. And on, further along my walk, I encountered some graffiti. I whipped out the app, took a picture of the graffiti, sent it into the graffiti section. So I, as a council member, use the app, and I've seen responsiveness as fast as the next day, depending on availability of staff. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Carwin, for the plug. Uh, our, our goal is to have it completed within 48 hours, and, and the app gets it directly to the person that needs to see it. So once we get it it goes to our, our our staff checks that system a couple times a day to and then assigns work orders obviously if it comes in middle of the day it might be assigned later or the the following morning if staff are available it'll, otherwise it'll be uh, the the morning after that so we we do try to do within a 48 hour window however um we have staff uh, staffing levels and priority work projects that might over that might extend it out a little bit because if we're out in the middle of doing a a major repair on a roadway out, um, i can't i don't want to pull staff off to do graffiti so we we have to look at priorities of projects so but graffiti um public property versus private so private property is separate uh, that's handled through the code enforcement so our uh, public works is responsible for anything within the public right of way. Um, so if it's on curbs, gutters, some some of our landscape walls, which are the block sound walls around the um, perimeters of, of developments, um, and then anything that's outside the public right of way is turned over to code enforcement. They notify that property owner, and then that property owner has a certain time to to repair make those repairs. Okay, thank you. We appreciate the presentation and hopefully uh, it gets used by everybody. All right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move on now to our next item. This 5.2 Menifee Police Department quarterly update. And I believe our interim chief Carr is here to provide us our quarterly update. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Good evening, Council. Um, let's see. We'll see if we can bring up the, uh, the quarterly report. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for that. Um, this quarter is gonna cover October through December of last year. And as we look up here at the pie chart, 
you'll see that we're still using the four beat system. I spoke last month that we have transitioned now into a six beat. So it'll look different in the future. Um, but with that, <clears throat> we had just about 13,000 calls for service during this period. Um, out of that, about 4,300 of it was proactive. This is where the officers are doing business checks, uh, foot patrols, uh, thing, you know, traffic stops, anything that they start. And then you'll see 869 alarms, with only one of those being a true uh, alarm. Everything else was, was false in that. Um, but out of that alarm, you'll see there was a 10% reduction from the prior quarter. I'm going was to that alarm residential or business? The, the one alarm? Hang on, let's see. I don't have that breakdown. I will let you know. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if it was a residential or business, so I'll get you that answer. Um, but again, we were down 10% over the prior quarter, so I, I will attribute to that to our letters that went out and getting some of the compliance from businesses and residents in fixing their alarm systems. So we're hoping that these letters will have a bigger impact as the quarters go on and, and reminding people just be responsible with your alarm systems. Next, you're gonna see our response times during that period. Um, you know, our key performance, we're still aiming for that six minute priority one response, that 15 minute for twos and 35s for threes. You'll notice that there were some adjustments here with the twos and threes being a quicker response time while our ones were slightly up. However, I do wanna point out that during this period of time, we did take in uh, 2,200 calls for service more than the prior quarter. So a little bit busier, um, probably due to the holidays. You're covering Thanksgiving, Christmas, family events, things of that nature. Uh, and then we get into our arrests. You'll see here 135 felony arrests, 119 misdemeanor arrests with our biggest standouts being those parole probation violations and then DUI alcohol violations. Um, again, this is where we ask the community. There's plenty of ride share opportunities out there. Please use those instead of getting behind the wheel. And then we coincide that with our traffic collisions. Here we had 293 traffic complaints, followed up with 453 traffic collision responses. So this is anywhere from minor injury, property damage to, um, as you'll see there, we had two fatalities during that quarter. So again, we're asking the community, get out there, be responsible, be patient, you know, drive and obey the rules. A lot of these things can be prevented if we just respect one another's space on the roadway. Um, I do want to highlight some of the efforts that were done by our traffic team during the same period uh, that come in here. As we talk about tra traffic citations, we had 1,362 in this period. But in addition to those citations and the enforcement that went out, we had three DUI saturations conducted. We had one DUI checkpoint one distracted driver operation, a motorcycle safety operation, two traffic enforcement operations. This is where we stick more officers out there looking for these violations. And then we did two maximum enforcement operations. These maximum enforcement was where we de teamed up with uh, code enforcement to help uh, areas within the community um, and complaints of traffic violations. In addition to all that, we were pushing out our education pieces. So there, was, there were nine social media releases covering various topics during the quarter, and then 14 media releases regarding traffic outside of our traffic collisions. So we are doing everything we can to push information out to the community, asking for your cooperation, asking you to be patient and respectful of others on the roadway, in addition to the enforcement efforts. Next you'll see here the crimes against person. Um, with our two biggest ones being aggravated assault and simple assault, these are directly related to uh, domestic violence and, and, a, and a, an amount of child abuse. Um, you can see here out of all those crimes, 173 total crimes against persons reported during that quarter. Uh, then we come into our crimes against property. Here we have 426 in grand total. Um, this is a 13% reduction from the prior quarter. Um, so even our property crimes were down and maybe our thieves were taking a break for the holidays. Um, 
but we are still pushing out efforts trying to get in these communities and that was part of the whole redesign of the beat system make it a little bit smaller a little bit easier more visibility with the officers out there so again uh, we're trying different methods to address these concerns um, crimes against society uh, you'll see here again um, big on drug and narcotic violations and then this one here you'll see that our weapon violations are quite high it's actually double what the prior quarter was uh, so we did get quite a few weapons off the street during this last quarter uh, from people who just aren't allowed to possess them or were using them in, improperly. And then we have code enforcement efforts. Um, 226 cases opened, 261 cases closed, and we still have a remaining 260 cases active. Uh, they are staying busy. They are getting out there. They're listening to the complaints. They're following up on the things that people are seeing. And they're also getting out there and following up on the, those cases so they can uh, remedy our issues. Uh, illegal signs removed. Again, people don't want to drive down the streets and see things posted up on chain link fences or uh, telephone poles, any of that. So they're doing a good job at keeping our roadways and our city looking good. Um, and then they're in, in, uh, issuing those administrative citations and then setting up missions to pick up that junk and trash. So uh, good job by code enforcement out there, staying busy and helping this community look good. Next is our, is our HOPE. This is our homeless housing uh, program uh, that we partner with uh, RUHS. So you'll notice here, and I wanna highlight the, the one housed in emergency housing. Uh, that's big that we're able to identify these people who will take the, take the assistance and we can get it to them right away. Uh, we also had 12 new contacts, so uh, we are seeing some people move through our city, but we still have our same 11 that we're continuing to give effort to to get them into placement. And then the two other services provided there, that's sober housing or um, job placements, things like that, uh, to help, th help them get back to a productive uh, life. Um, next is our CBAT, our mental health outreach. So here you're gonna see we had a total of 108 calls and we really wanna highlight the time being spent by the CBAT team. So this is our clinician that rides with our officer. And on average during this quarter, they were spending 40 minutes. And this is follow-up. You'll notice there are 71%, the mental health history. These are people who have been contacted by us, um, either a 5150 or had an encounter that we believed was on the verge of a mental crisis. And they do follow-up to see what kind of treatment, what kind of things we can give to the family for resources. Uh, so it's good to see that we're spending a lot of time addressing people who are in need and getting back to them, um, not just dealing with the, the new. Um, and then we had a 13% dealing with the homeless, trying to get them that mental health assistance that's needed, get them off the streets. And with that, that concludes my report. Do you have any questions I can answer for you? All right, Chief, thank you. Um, I do have a quick question. Um, will you remind us or update us regarding the new law regarding care court and the ability to, uh, with behavioral health, to um, compel some of those folks that um, are having mental issues to be able to compel them to accept the help. Is that has it taken effect? Do is that in in process yet? So the the compelling is a is a it's a questionable point on whether you want to compel someone to it. And really our angle on it right now is while you could get a court to compel it, we'd rather go with the efforts of compliance um, and use these clinicians. So um, I don't know that we're going to go down the angle of compelling someone um, unless there's an, a violent need or something that's egregious to the community safety as it was intended. All right, thanks for the update. Uh, Council Member Sobeck. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I do have one question, and thank you for your report. Um, on uh, crimes against person, you mentioned that domestic violence is one of the highest crimes that we're seeing in this area, in the city. Um, and you had mentioned that you do media releases um, that you had done for traffic citation. Um, will you consider doing any kind of media releases uh, for uh, domestic violence to let people know how they can get help before it gets to that point. Do we have anything like that? Um, we scheduled? do have we do have resource links on our web page. Uh, we also make sure that when we contact these victims that we're providing them with several different resource documents, um, 
making phone calls for them. We have an agreement with the Riverside County DA's office for victim advocacy. We also work with the Family Justice Center uh, who will be notified every time that we, we obtain an emergency protective order. Um, they will reach back out to the victim as well. So we do try to push out as much information as we can. And then obviously uh, we have uh, like Domestic Violence Awareness Month, we're really hyping up on it, but all year long we do keep our resource page up um, and then have conversations with these people as we come across them. Okay, because preventive is probably the best thing that we can do. Absolutely. Okay, okay thank you. And Council Member Estrada. How are you doing, Mr. Carr? Excellent, sir. How are you? Thank you for your service. Oh, thank you. I've had a lot of conversations with residents in my district about Quell Valley, and they would like to see a bigger presence there with regards to code enforcement. They see uh, and they feel that the community there could use a little bit more attention. Can you speak a little bit to maybe the challenges of Quell Valley and how you handle Quell Valley specifically? Uh, specifically, we do have, so we have spread our code enforcement officers. Um, they will take different caseloads. They will take different areas just out of an ease of tracking what they have going on. Um, so we do have code enforcement working out there. Again, we're trying to work through education and compliance rather than punitive actions, right? So it, it is more community engagement. It's more discussion and then looking for opportunities to find assistance for them. Um, You'll notice during that last quarter, we did team up with code enforcement. We went out there with our traffic officers and we were dealing with a lot of the traffic complaints that we've received from your community in addition to assisting code enforcement with removing uh, illegally parked vehicles, uh, trash dumping, uh, things like that. So that's what I'm talking about with the missions is we're looking for areas within our community to assist everyone that comes in and, you know, 46 and a half square miles, we're working with all the communities, but, um, you know, we, we attend those monthly meetings up at the Moose Lodge and, you know, we do listen to what's coming in and then we try and make an action plan to work with them. Uh, so if you, if you are hearing from community members that they don't feel they're getting the service, have them reach out to our code enforcement supervisor or, you know, reach out to myself and we'll have those communications. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Any other questions, comments? All right, Chief Carr, thanks so much. Uh, we appreciate it. Please pass on to the team that we hear compliments about our police department all the time. And so thank you and thank your team for everything they do. So. Well, thank you. We're grateful. And believe me, they all understand the support we have from you. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Chief. All right. Uh, and now we have Chief Olson for our 5.3 Fire Department quarterly update. Welcome, sir. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Your quarterly update for uh, November, October, and December. And I've also thrown in some year-end 2022 stats on the slide. So this is for the quarter, and this breaks down all calls that were run within the city. Notice I highlighted some along the bottom there. Uh, so 2,698 medical calls for service. We had five residential structure fires, 179, <clears throat> excuse me, traffic collisions, uh, 3,338 calls for the quarter. And then some other statistics, we averaged a 4.7 minute response time, which is good. We're trying to stay under that five minute bar. Uh, for our assistance to the city of Canyon Lake, we went in seven, excuse me, 11 times. And Canyon Lake Fire Department assisted the city of Menifee four times. And then for our cooperative fire protection, we went outside the city 339 times and received assistance 168 times. For our fire marshal's office, uh, this breakdown in the column shows what their work performance was by month, and then the last column with the totals is the year in total, so I'll go through those. The total reviews conducted was 951 for the year, and total inspections conducted was 4,148. And then for our performance measures, our plan review turnaround time, we're trying to stay under that 10-day mark. Our second uh, fire safety specialist started in November, so you can start to see that number trend down towards what we're working on. And we're hopeful that that'll be successful once she's fully trained and independent and on her own. Uh, for our inspection turnaround goal, we're meeting the mark at a two-day turnaround. And then for our community engagement, you can see we covered all ages. So we got the honor of retired fire captain and U.S. Navy veteran on his 97th birthday. We attended some uh, 
trunk or treat throughout the, the city. We also got to do a career day at the Santa Rosa Academy and do some part fire prevention and show and tell education with some of the younger. And then we also got to do, uh, Target was nice enough to sponsor us doing our annual firefighter uh, shop with a firefighter event where we get to give uh, some children nice gifts during the Christmas time and then we also got to break ground in early December on our new fire station that'll be better strategically located and allow us to put more modernized fire equipment so. and then this is our 2022 year in stats so the top left slide that you see there with the pie chart shows where all those calls for service happened in 2022 one of the things to note on there with that better strategic location of Station 5, it'll better serve both Quail Valley and AMR and kind of help out citywide with that overall call volume. And then the uh, right hand side on the top there breaks down all the calls for service by categories. And then in the bottom left shows run report for each of the apparatus within the city and the calls that they actually ran. So small sample size for us with our new medic squad, but you can see on there it did have an impact. It already took in 1,228 calls for the year starting at September 5th is when we put that into service. And you'll notice it's also starting to drop those numbers down. So for the medic patrol, it was up over 4,100 calls the previous year. It's now down. Um, and another thing to note on there, if you look at the response time in the middle is at 4.8. We were at 5.1 for 2021. So we're starting to see our response times drop down. Total calls for the year was 13,340. And then to kind of give you an idea, as the city's grown, so is our call volume. That's showing like a seven year period of, of all of our uh, calls for service. There's that 5,000 foot view that shows all the calls for within the city for 2022. Blue or medical, the orangish brown color would be public service assist calls, and then the red would be fire, and then miscellaneous call categories within there. And then for our public safety message, remind everybody, uh, please turn off any portable heaters or patio heaters and don't leave them unattended. And remember not to leave your fireplace unattended and please put an ember screen in front of it. That concludes my report. Have any questions? Excellent, Chief Olson. Uh, thank you very much. Council members, do we have any questions or comments? Uh, Council member Sobek. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Ocean, Olson, for your report. And uh, I, I, uh, I've enjoyed that you added the 222 year in in this as well. I have a question. Um, assisted outside the city of Menifee 339 times calls for service and then uh, received assistance into the city um, 168 times. This would be on the east side of the city uh, and north. Would that be in total? So in that total, would be calls that would include um, the cities of Lake Elsinore, Wildemar, the east side and Paris. Okay. All right. So I know on the east end, uh, just past our city, the county is looking at a uh, possible new fire station out in that area to help. Um, is there any update on that? In site selection, um, I've seen, I've had a couple of sites thrown my way to look at and, and give my opinion on, and it's everything along uh, the Scott Road corridor from just outside the city limit from Leon all the way across Highway 79 where it turns into Washington. So they're still looking at that and trying to evaluate what's the best site and what's affordable. Okay. But it, it is actively being searched for. Okay, because we're seeing more and more numbers uh, as the population increases in the county area, our engines going out into that area. And I'm impressed that you've been able to keep the response time down under five minutes. So thank you. And thank you to your, your firefighters. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, hearing none, thank you, Chief. Uh, as I mentioned to Captain or Chief Carr, please pass on our gratitude and appreciation to your team. Do. You're doing thank a great you. job. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, let's go to item six now on our agenda. This is agenda approval or modifications. And Madam Clerk, I think we do have uh, an item to reschedule, right? Can you update us on that? Yes, staff is requesting to continue 10.16. 10 and that's a city manager's um, annual performance report. Okay, so that, 2022. All right, so that was in our consent agenda. We're going to remove that. And um, so, council members, uh, can I get an approval for the agenda as, modifi as modified? If uh, you're in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, our uh, agenda is approved for tonight. Let's now move to item seven. This is public comments on non agenda items. 
This is the time for members of the public to address the council about items that are not listed on the agenda. The Brown Act limits the council's ability to respond to those comments on non-agendized matters at the time the comments are made. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes on any single item. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any public comments on non-agenda items? Do you have any speaker slips over there? I do, we have Robert LaFond. Okay. Welcome, Mr. LaFon. We appreciate you coming. Thank you. Evening, everybody. So <clears throat> I came here tonight because um, we had our side-by-side -side stolen from our property. And the people that were with it were driving a silver 2016 Hyundai Sonata. Um, so the side-by-side -side was found at the Lago Vista Sports Park. So we recovered it, and we wanted to find out, well, who did this and who stole it? Well, that park has cameras all over the park. So we went down to the police station to find out uh, what we could do about getting videos of that time period and what we can see on who's driving in or out. And we were told that the camera systems were all offline. <clears throat> Those are Valley Wide's cameras, right? I don't know who they are. Okay. So. Anyway, I'm wondering if we can do something about that for the city, for the safety, and get the cameras working. So I, I did give something to the gal over there, so I don't know if she gave it to you. Um, but yes, the back of it is what I want to say. So thank you very much. All right, we appreciate you coming and sharing, and I'm sorry that you uh, experienced that. And uh, w So you were able to recover your vehicle? We did. Okay, good. Yes. Good. All right, so our staff can make sure that we uh, investigate and find out what's going on with the cameras over there. I believe that is Valley Wide's jurisdiction, so they can help uh, make sure that that gets addressed. Okay, thank you. All right, you. thank you. Appreciate you coming. Madam Clerk, do we have any other uh, public comments? We have no requests at this time. Okay, uh, hearing none, we're going to go ahead and move on on our agenda. Let's go to item eight. This is council member updates and comments. I'll start on my right, which is Councilman Dean Dinas. Thank you. Uh, one thing to report out, uh, RTA has subcommittees called the T-NOW, and uh, we have the Southwest T-NOW here. Uh, we met, and uh, somehow I got uh, voted in as the vice chair for that. So oh, wow. uh, we, it's a smaller group so that we can have a, more of a working group so we can get more in information and discussion about transportation issues as opposed to the overall larger uh, RTA board of directors. That's all I have. All right, very good, thank you. Um, Council Member Estrada. I just wanted to give a shout out to all the city staff that I've been working with over the past couple weeks. Everyone has been very professional, very educated, and I want all the residents to know that you're in good hands and these people are very experienced and educated and proud to be here. That's very nice of you to say. All right, uh, Council Member Sobeck. Good evening. Um, I do have a few pictures just to show out like I do on my PowerPoint, but I'm glad that Pastor Stone's still here. I'm going to start off with Holland Road Overpass. And um, just to give you an update that um, you can send to receive weekly updates at info at hollandroadoverpass.com. You can also receive text messages, and maybe our city staff can put this information out there um, so our residents can receive this. Um, this week, um, Holland Road Overpass is continuing to relocate underground utilities, and um, they're continuing to prepare for the cut, cap, irrigation, remove vegetation and landscaping. So they are working on it, just to let you know, and you can, anyone can sign up to receive those updates on their on their little email. I've been getting them once a week and kind of trying to share them. So I wanted to let you know that. I'm so glad you were still here. So um, just on my just a few little updates on my um, council member uh, slides. There we go. Um, just the You Matter workshop continues. We started this um, at coming out of the pandemic. A lot of um, people are still experiencing depression and wellness issues. And so um, 
We've uh, partnered with Riverside University Health. I have a flyer here that's available on our You Matter website and that there are free workshops online coming up for anyone who might be interested. Um, and I attended one of them and it was just excellent. I have gone ahead and taken the QPR. Um, uh, what was it? It's kind of like uh, CPR. I took the workshop, got a certificate. QPR stands for a quick, um, let's see if I can remember now, uh, quick response. Let's see, quick P. Now I, can, now I can't even remember the name of it. Um, quick persuade and response, and it has to do with those who might be suffering from uh, maybe uh, thoughts of suicide. And it, it's a class that you can take and get certified to help those um, in all the different hats we wear, whether it's uh, an employee, a grandparent, a parent, uh, somebody that you work with, and it's just an excellent course, so I just highly recommend it. They're actually offering that. Um, our city is Know the Signs, and it's going to be for teen and young adults, and so that will be coming up in our city. Um, I attended and represented our city at the swearing-in of Bill Asaley, our new assembly person for the 63rd District. It was held at the historical Riverside Courthouse. Um, it was a nice event. Congressman Calvert was there along with other uh, dignitaries across the county. So I was able to represent our city and be there um, letting him know that uh, we appreciate him and congratulate him. Um, I went on the point and time count this year. Um, I just want to thank uh, Captain Gutierrez, at Eddie Gutierrez, uh, for uh, letting me be on his team. I have gone on this point in time count for over six years, um, tracking the homeless in our city. And this year, I have never seen so many volunteers, and it was mostly our police department, our police volunteers. We were out at uh, 5 o'clock in the morning. We had to show up, get briefed, and then we were out at 5.30 in the morning. Um, this year, I believe the count was 32 homeless, if, if I have that right. Um, that we engaged with. And the idea is to um, let them know there's resources available. I was able, with Captain Gutierrez, we were able to interview three different homeless people. One of them is, is one of our, our regulars that lives in, in Sun City. So we were able to talk to him, and, and um, he actually spoke to us. He usually avoids the interview, but he did um, share his information with us. And... Um, Hopefully, some of these people will take advantage. We, uh, some of them said that they would like to be contacted um, and, and take advantage of help. And so there was a follow-up with them with that. But I just want to thank our police department and all of our Menifee Police Department volunteers who, who, were, who came out that morning. Um, each, of the each of the homeless received a little backpack with socks. The beanies that um, were presented here um, at one of our last city council meetings by the Knitting and Crocheting Club. Um, little toiletries. So they received a nice backpack for taking the interview and speaking to us. So it was, it was good. Um, uh, most of us on the city council were at Fishbone, but I want to let our residents know that we did have a ribbon cutting yesterday in grand opening. And um, what's impressive about Fishbone is that Joe and Andrea Powell are local residents. Joe used to work for the city of Menifee in our public, our community service department, and his wife Andrea worked at Menifee Hospital, Global Hospital, and they've opened up Fishbone. And I didn't get to try it yesterday. I'm looking to go back with my husband, but it, um, they said it's like a New Orleans flavor. So try it out if you like that type of fish. Um, and that's, that's all I have for tonight. All right, thank you for your report. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Carwin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I am the alternate to Council Member Dynas on the RTA Executive Committee, and I had the great pleasure of serving in his 
Stead at the last meeting. There were as acknowledgement of the outgoing president, Zach Schwank, and thank him for his service and really impressive resume of things that he's been able to accomplish during his time. Uh, they discussed some public outreach that's going to be happening for route adjustments, and they're going to be doing pop-up um, opportunities to talk to people about ridership and what the needs are and maybe moving some of the routes around to make it a more efficient process. And then they were talking about some purchasing of some new vehicles to add to the fleet to make it um, a, a more efficient fleet and, and cover more ground. So that was a good meeting. I was glad I got to attend it. Um, the mayor and I are the city council representatives on the economic development ad hoc committee. And uh, we met on Monday, had an opportunity to discuss some hotel interest for new hotels that are maybe interested in coming to the city of Menifee and the great success and some applications under our menu grant for um, restaurants looking to come to town and need some assistance getting started. Um, some real thrilling opportunities are coming to town, some mom and pops, exactly what people are looking for. Um, and then as uh, Council Member Sobek pointed out, I, I attended the fishbone ribbon cutting. And I do want to point out, I did get an email from a resident saying, hey, look, we really like some, some really healthy options. And this whole plaza where fishbone is, so fishbone has both fried and grilled fish options. So what's healthier than grilled fish? I really don't know what to tell you. Uh, so that, but that whole strip, we've got Urbane Cafe, which is fresh salads. We've got Fishbone there, which is now doing grilled seafood on the Mediterranean Grill, Luna Grill, all kind of right in a row in the same building. So that's a real strip mall for, and then Sprouts is in there too for, for doing your shopping. Somebody's asking me, why don't we have a Whole Foods market? I said, we'll go see Sprouts. So uh, at the risk of sounding like a commercial, I just wanted to let people know that we've got these small small opportunities for really healthy dining that do exist if you if you check them out and look for it um and that's all i've got all right very good report by the way warning my next update at the next meeting is probably going to be about 45 minutes based on all the things i've got coming up in the next couple of You're weeks so be busy? yeah okay. so pack a lunch all right thank you bob all right um i'm going to try to be quick um this is since our last meeting uh january 18th um, on the 19th i went to neighbors monthly business mixer over at the corporate room in wildemar and mayor pro tem carwin and i joined um the city manager staff in an introductory meeting with uh our senate our assemblyman bill Asaley and his legislative staff it's a good introduction and um, our staff did show um some things that are important that are big projects that are happening here so that he's aware of those. Um, then there was a chamber mixer that was hosted by WellQuest, uh, our senior living place on Antelope Road, and that was a very nice mixer. On, uh, then on Saturday the 21st, our historical association had a program on Lambs Canyon, and the Lamb family actually lived here in Menifee as well. Uh, on Monday the 23rd, I attended the River, Western Riverside County Pro Projects and Programs Commission uh, in Riverside. And then on Tuesday the 24th, there was a virtual meeting with um, State Senator Ochoa Bogue and her legislative staff. And it was good to um, provide some updates for her and have her share things that she's bringing uh, on behalf of the city to the state. All right, and then on Thursday the 26th, there was an all chambers mega mixer. It was at Lake Elsinore Storm. It was very well attended, um, a great opportunity for our Menifee businesses to connect with some of the other businesses in the Southwest Riverside County area. And also a lot of elected officials were there from um, our surrounding cities. On Saturday the 28th, I attended Fred T. Paris Day over in Paris at their uh, museum uh, that's there and we, we're honoring the Stenlake family. It actually lives in Menifee, um, but he's also very involved in uh, the history of Paris. On Monday the 30th, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Carwin and I uh, had our Economic Development Subcommittee meeting, as was mentioned. And then yesterday was our fish, I attended the Fishbone Grand Opening, and we were, it was great to welcome them. Um, and as I had mentioned at the meeting, I was proud to be able to bring a mom and pop type restaurant uh, locally owned. It's not a drive-through fast food chain. It's a nice, nicer upscale place. So I wanted to uh, give some kudos to our economic development team for helping bring some of those things that our uh, members of the residents of this uh, city have been asking for. So 
And then finally, I wanted to announce, council members, I'm not going to be here the next couple of days. Uh, tomorrow and Friday, I'm going to be at RCTC's annual um, workshops and conference that we do, uh, which will be in Palm Springs. So I'll be leaving in the morning. I'll be back on the weekend. So that's all I have. If anybody else has anything else, hearing none, we're going to move on on our agenda. And we are on item 9 for approval of minutes, but there's none to approve. So let's go to item 10, our consent calendar. All matters on the consent calendar are to be approved in one motion unless a council member requests a separate action on a specific item on the consent calendar. If an item is removed from the consent calendar, it'll be discussed individually and acted upon separately. Unless otherwise directed by a member of the council, the vote on ordinance adoptions will reflect reflect the prior action of each council member when the ordinance was introduced. However, if a council member is not present at the city council meeting, their vote will be reflected as absence. That being read, um, Madam Clerk, do we have uh, any correspondence first, uh, correspondence for our consent calendar items? We do, it's for 10.6, uh, 10 excuse me. Okay, and it's that's in our red, red folder. folders, all Correct. right, very good. And then do we have any public comments or anyone wishing to speak on our consent calendar items this evening? We do not. All right, thank you. Um, council members, uh, do we have any items that we would like to pull from consent calendar or discussion? Um, okay, council member Sobek. I'd like to pull 10.6. 10.6? Excuse me, sorry, wrong one. 10.12. 10.12. And we can do 10.6. <laughs> and you want to pull 10.6? Yeah, we'll go ahead. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, and uh, Councilman Estrada? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to pull 10.7, please. Okay, 10.7. And Mayor Pro Tem Carwin? 10.5, please. 10.5, you got it. And I'm going to pull uh, item 10.14. And if there's no others, can I get a motion to approve the balance, please? Oh, motion to approve the balance with a continuation of 10.16. Very good, second. thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second, so uh, what we'll do is wait for the clerk to pull that up. I think I'm... Boop, boop. We just move to a verbal. All right, so we're gonna do a voice vote. Madam Clerk, would you go ahead and call roll on this? Absolutely. So I think the motion was by Dean. Councilman Dinas and seconded by Councilmember Sobeck. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Dinas? Aye. Councilmember Estrada? Aye. Councilmember Sobeck? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Carwin? Aye. And Mayor Zimmerman? Aye. Thank you. So that passes unanimously. And so we will now take our first polled item, which is item 10.5. Councilmember Carwin, what's your pleasure? Sir? I'd like a staff report, please. Okay. Welcome, Ms. Gonzalez. Streamlined. <laughs> Can we please pull it up? So 10.5 is the approval and purchase and sale agreement for the acquisition of real property. Background. Menifee's growing extremely fast. So therefore, we've had a lack of public facilities, as we all are very aware. There's limited opportunities for facilities. Staff has been working since 2020 on trying to identify potential space within the city. The current substation that is located at Cherry Hills Plaza is relatively small, just around 2,000 square feet. Um, and the current lease for the existing substation has remaining five years on it. To better serve our community, the facility that is before you tonight to acquire is proposed to house a larger municipal um, substation utilizing a portion of the building for the following divisions, a front counter reporting, problem oriented policing pop team, patrol and traffic division. The remaining substation is being proposed as a business incubator. Incubators provide much needed workspace, mentorship, education, and allows businesses really to take form at the early stages of business growth. Staff would be bringing this back to City Council for future consideration as um, we start to delve into tenant improvements and so forth and partnering with potential um, agencies to run that. In addition, staff is currently conducting a feasibility study uh, for an incubator growth, which is required by the EDA for any future uh, incubator grant 
um, opportunities. A little bit about the facility. Currently, um, it is owned by Bank of America, who has, um, over the time of 2020, has reduced their current facilities um, nationally, uh, affecting Menifee at our current uh, Cherry Hills Plaza. The current building right now is under 9,000 square feet. The total size is just under 50,000 square feet and currently has 30 surface parking spaces. Staff has completed multiple site visits and we've also run comparables for the acquisition. As you can see off of the map de uh, depicted below or onto the side there, it is actually the um, square to the south along um, Cherry Hills Boulevard. Staff has negotiated uh, for the facility well below market value. Um, we're very excited about this opportunity um, to present um, to you, but it is 1.675, um, and it is just around um, $188 uh, dollars per square foot. The comparables is around 200 to about $488 um, dollars per square foot. So it's quite an investment for us, um, opportunity-wise. Uh, a phase one um, has been completed and um, did come back clear. There are some um, minor things when it comes to um, asbestos, um, which is completely expected when you look at facilities of its, um, of its uh, length of being around from the 1960s. It's very common to encounter that. So really for staff, it's just it adds an additional layer. And we went through it, um, believe it or not, when we um, built the fire station seven. Very, very common. Um, staff is also estimating about half a million dollars for, uh, for tenant improvements of the facility um, to include but not limited to demolition, furniture and fixtures, ADA restrooms that are required, flooring, and then some IT um, improvements for the facility. The aggregate cost of the acquisition, including closing costs, broker fees, appraisals, and the tenant improvements is 2.215. So the fiscal impact for the acquisition is 2.215. And again, that includes the acquisition closing costs and tenant improvements. And then funding for the acquisition is being recommended as part of use of our ARP funds. And again, um, according to our revenue council, it would be utilizing fund 301, which is our grant fund. Um, just as a precursor, ongoing maintenance costs, um, including but not limited to utilities, janitorial services, the alarm service, building maintenance and repairs, um, will be incorporated as part of our ongoing operational costs that are included in our respective budget cycles, which is very common to our existing uh, facility for our substation uh, at the plaza. So with that, you said make it streamlined, so hopefully this is fast enough, sir. Um, but staff's recommendation, again, is to approve uh, the acquisition not to exceed 1.675 for the facility, approve the city manager's um, designation to execute any agreements related to titles, fees, insurance, formal bonding, appraisal, not to exceed 40,000, and then approve the CIP budget of 500,000 for any necessary improvements for the facility, and then make a budget amendment resolution appropriating the 2.215 um, in expenditures and revenues utilizing the ARP funds towards the purchase and acquisition. Any questions? Uh, yes, nice job. Um, <laughs> What is the breakdown on the ARP funds? How much are we using in ARP funds towards this? I'm going to ask our Deputy Finance Director, Margarita Cornejo, who has a great snapshot on the utilization of those funds. Hi, good afternoon, council members of the public. So the proposal is to fund this full acquisition and tenant improvements 100% with ARPA funds. The use of that, those funds is meant to be used through December of 2024. So we do still have some time, but we are getting closer to the deadline for that. And really, those funds are one-time um, funding that we're getting. So the opportunity to use it for things like these and one-time expenses really aligns with that. Um, following if the approval of this acquisition is done today, the balance balance on the ARPA grant funds allocated to the city would be around $2.5 million. So well, that would include the tenant improvements and everything like that, the 2.2 entire cost of this, the 2.215 entire cost of this project would be covered by the ARPA funds? Yes, that is correct. Excellent. That's what I needed to know. Any other thoughts or comments, council members? Do you want to move to approve, please? Move to approve. Thank you. I'll second.
All right, so uh, we have a motion from Mayor Pro Tem Carwin and a second from Council Member Sobeck. And can we do a voice vote for the rest, please? Yes. Council Member Estrada? Aye. Council Member Sobeck? Aye. Council Member Dinas? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Carwin? Aye. And Mayor Zimmerman? Aye. That passes unanimously. We'll come to our next polled item. This was polled by Council Member Sobeck, and it's 10.6. 10.6 is the gr agreement with NV5 for design services for Murrieta Road Bridge over the Salt Creek Channel. And I see we have Mr. Fiddler, so thank you for coming. Uh, Council Member Sobeck, what's your pleasure? Yes. Um, I, was, I was actually surprised to see this um, moved up. I thought we had other priority projects. So can you share with me why this design is coming to us now and what funding we are going to be using for this design of one? Sure, Point I can seven. provide a prov uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Mayor, Council Members, uh, as you're aware, um, the Marietta Road Bridge over Salt Creek uh, project is part of the Capital Improvement Program, which was adopted uh, this July or last June, implemented uh, July of 2022. So it is a project in the CIP that we moved forward and uh, the council has approved as part of the priority of the uh, capital improvement program. Um, some of the background, uh, the Marietta Road Bridge over the Salt Creek, um, obviously located on Marietta between Park and uh, Park City Avenue and Camino del Sol Norte. Uh, the project is, or the current uh, roadway is two lanes. The project will expand it to four lanes. Uh, as you're aware, there's a significant amount of development in the northwest part of town. Uh, we also have a project in the capital improvement program to widen and extend Valley Boulevard, which will, uh, which will connect into uh, Marietta just north of Salt Creek. Uh, the project also includes pedestrian walkways, sidewalks, uh, ADA improvements, architectural features. We're uh, reconnecting the signalized trail, I mean the, a multi-use trail with a signal um, and then making drainage improvements throughout the area. Uh, the purpose and need. Uh, the project is actually funded through a roads, uh, uh, road bridge benefit district, an RBBD. Um, the, uh, this is uh, restricted use. There's only a few projects within the uh, city limits that can actually use these funds. The Salt Creek, uh, Murrieta Road over Salt Creek is one project, and then the, another project to widen along Murrieta Road between Holland and McCall. The Riverside County Flood Control District, we work with them, obviously, because this falls within their jurisdiction. Um, as you're aware, that we're one of the fifth fastest growing cities in the state. But this project doesn't just serve our community. This project also serves communities around us because as development occurs east of the city, more uh, impervious surfaces are placed, more drainage systems are placed, and all these waters are funneled to the Salt Creek Channel. So over the years, as more development occurs, we're going to start to see more water within that channel because that's, that's what the design purpose was, is to funnel the, the flows through, through the city limits. So that's the second major reason why this project. First one being that we need the capacity for our roadways on uh, Murrieta between Newport and the New Valley Road connection. And the second is to keep up with the demand for, or the, the um, additional water flows that will be coming in the future. Um, because of environmental reviews takes many years, this project needs to be initiated now. Uh, you guys are all aware of how long it took to get Holland Road uh, through its process. We're currently working through the Bradley Road, uh, Bridge project over the Salt Creek. These are multi-year projects that take anywhere from six to 10 years to complete, to go through all the environmental permitting, the uh, environmental documents, the designs, the uh, regulatory permitting. So th th there, we need to get in front of the um, development and the um, additional water that's gonna be coming through this uh, corridor. 
The Valley Boulevard widening project will create uh, an extension to Marietta Road. Uh, we will be connecting Valley Boulevard through the MWD desalter plant that's just north of there. So that connection will lead to new developments that are occurring up in the northwest. We have approximately a thousand new homes that are in some form of process through different mappings. That are, that are up in that area. So we, we will see more um, ac activity on Valley Boulevard and this section of Marietta between Valley Boulevard and Newport. Project goals, is, uh, this, pro this area has been identified as an existing flood prone area in the city by a, in our local hazardous mitigation plan. Uh, the project would elevate the roadway above our 100 year uh, floodplain elevation. Um, uh, again, um, we have one, you know, localized rain events, but uh, we're also going to expect um, additional flows coming from the development to the east. Uh, the, pro the project would address future traffic needs with the new development and the widening of Valley Boulevard uh, between that intersection and Newport. And it also improves emergency access during uh, flood events. And lastly, the project will include uh, bicycle and pedestrian facilities. Uh, this, uh, we did have two people that uh, proposed on this. We have MV5 and CNS engineers. Uh, this is the rankings and the fee proposals for both of those. Uh, and the final design for the budget, uh, the final design, the design budget for the project was 1.8, so this falls in line with what was the, uh, we, the proposal we received. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Fiddler. Um, council members, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. so I appreciate the um, presentation because I was unaware that you were gonna widen it as well. And I was kind of thinking, why aren't we waiting until Bradley Road Bridge is complete to see if it was going to be needed and if that would help the emergency access going in and back and forth from Sun City to Newport East or north, south of the you know uh, streets of the city. So um, when you talked about the war, the widening, how far on Marietta Road then are we going to? Are you look? Is that a CIP project that you it, mentioned too it's all, that's going to be widened? Um, so with this project, we will be widening from uh, basically um, Park City to um, the new Valley Boulevard intersection. And that will include uh, four lanes, two in each direction. Right now, it's obviously one lane in each direction. So it'll get us additional capacity for that new connection for the Valley Boulevard. Um, Valley Boulevard, we're looking at probably project completions somewhere in 2025 or 2026. Um, so we will have additional traffic flows coming through that area. And what funding did you say source that we're being able to it's, use for this? It's a, a Roads and Bridge Benefit District, Menifee Valley Roads and Bridge Benefit District. And is that something we had to apply for? Is that something we have an account of and we no, have the money sitting there? No, we collect funds through development, similar to DIF, and as part of those, if they fall within that region, they pay these fees, and these fees are, can only be used in our city at those two different locations, Okay. those two different projects. All right, thank you very much for, for sharing that. And it's great questions because um, I had similar ones and I just want to make sure that everybody understands that we have money collected from rooftops for RBBD and it can't be used elsewhere at some other things. It's, we're limited to wh where we can put that money and we need to spend it. So this is the place for it. Even though the project may not be the hot one that we need to do right away, it's the place for this money. So at least we can kind of program it and get that going and get it shovel ready so that when it is ready, we can hit the ground running. So that's correct. I think it's the right thing. Yeah. All right, council members, any other thoughts? Can we get a motion? Yes. So I'd like to make a motion. We approve 10.6. Excellent. Second. Go ahead and call roll, please. Councilmember Sobek? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Carwin? Aye. Councilmember Dinas? Aye. Councilmember Estrada? Aye. And Mayor Zimmerman? 
Aye. So that passes unanimously. Our next pulled item by Councilmember Estrada was 10.7. That's the agreement with KTU and A for development of our complete streets plan. And I see Mr. Fiddler still here. So uh, Councilman Estrada, what's your pleasure? Did you have a question or did you want to report? Yes, I had a couple questions, Mr. Fiddler. If we go to slide four. Um, okay, okay can, um, can, if can we can please display that, the please. Slide? Yeah. Do you want me to go through the presentation or no. you just want me to jump? No, okay. I just have a specific question about the interview scores at the bottom of slide four. Oh, maybe, hold on, went too far. Okay, at the bottom there, we can see that KTUNA received an interview score of 83%, and then STC's traffic received a interview score of 82%, and there's a $23,000 difference there. The recommendation was to take KTUNA. Can you give me some um, of the backstory on maybe what's the difference between the 83% and the 82% and why that would justify paying an extra $23,000? I may have um, our finance um help us with this because we, we go through an RFQ, RFP process and there's strict guidelines that we have to follow as part of the, that process and we don't actually see the free proposals until we make a selection. So we base it off of the, um, the, perform the um, performance of the, uh, the consultant. So uh, the other thing we look at is we look to see if their fee proposal falls in line with what our anticipated um, budgets are. But I, I want to turn it over to uh, Ms. Cornejo to, pr to provide a little bit more detail on the RFQ, RFP process because they, they run that uh, process. Good afternoon again. Okay, so regarding the question on RFP and an RFQ, so when it comes to professional services, and in particular professional design services, the industry standard for public agencies is to do a qualifications-based selection, in which really they, um, in, in all procurements, goods and services, the, what you're trying to accomplish is getting the best quality service or good. When it comes to professional services, price is obviously gonna be a factor because there's a budget that you need to work in. But when it comes to the selection process in itself, in the evaluation process, what you're really focusing and zoning in is actually on the qualification. So it'll be things like the proposed team that's being put forth for a project like this, the experience that they may have, and just, um, specific criteria that's established in the RFP solicitation in itself. An evaluation committee is put together of staff that is experienced and well-versed in that particular project, and then they're evaluated on the proposal itself, and in this instance, there's a second phase where interviews are completed. At the conclusion of that, there is an overall discussion with the selection committee on who is the recommended proposal to be brought forth, and at that point, the um, project or price negotiations begin to align it with the budget. So that's kind of in general the approach that goes into. Now your question on that 1% difference, it's a, it's a good one to have in place because at onset you may say, well, it's only, it's a, only a 1% um, difference in the points. But behind that 1%, there's a lot of discussion and analysis that's had by the evaluators and components. I believe there is a slide in the presentation that kind of highlights some of the things that KTUNA in this particular project had as strengths that are above and beyond um, STC's proposals. Not to say that STC did not provide a very competitive proposal, and that's why you see the close in the range. But at the end and at, at the conclusion and the evaluation of the committee, there were some key out outstanding things that yes, in that 1% are captured um, enough for staff to move forward with the recommendation of moving forward with KTUNA. And Nick, I don't know if you want to highlight in this particular one what KTUNA was offering, but I think that might be useful to kind of get an understanding of kind of in this particular proposal what stood out for them. Can we get the slide back up, please? The other thing I would like to add is this is a state funded, it's a grant, so we do have to follow Caltrans uh, guidelines as well, uh, that, that, which Ms. Corneo had mentioned. So, 
So um, these are some of the things that highlighted we, where we felt that kind of put them above and beyond what the STC um, had. Um, they do have unique relationship with um, Riverside Uni uh, University Health System. So they have a greater ability to do community outreach. Uh, they did participate in our local road and safety plan, which is very critical to tying in both bike and pest pedestrian um, facilities in, into the, the plan. And then uh, KTUA provides a comprehensive project management plan to keep the project on uh, time. So. Those we felt were very high qualities as part of the um, selection process. And my, uh, the next thing I'd like to bring up to council is, do we think that the 1% difference is worth the squeeze for 23,000? <clears throat> I don't hear anybody else uh, answering that question, but I, I'm okay with it. I know a lot of times when we evaluate um, um, some of the those proposing um, that's scored on um, past work, um, representative projects, the strength of the um, team that's being proposed to work on it, their familiarity with the city. I mean, there's so many different things that our evaluation team measures. It's not just money. In fact, sometimes there's closed bids where we don't have any idea who's proposing an amount, we're selecting them based on um, their performance. So uh, I know this is kind of typical. And Mr. Fiddler, will you remind us, most of this money's coming from Caltrans, right? Isn't there like 221,000 towards this from Caltrans and our share's 28,000, if I'm not right? That, that's correct. Um, it is, a, um, I think it's 88.47, 11% is city and the, the rest is uh, yeah. uh, Caltrans. Council members, do you want to share any more on, on the question? And I would, I would just like to add, um, uh, Councilman Estrada, I think that it was talked about briefly, but just to make it clear, on this pr process, we did go through the interview process, not we, the committee, went through the interview process prior to even seeing the actual price proposals because they want to be have an independent evaluation of the actual qualifications for the proposers without being um, swayed by the actual cost uh, because it's not cost-based, it's a mix, and we want to make sure, as, as Ms. Cornejo said, we want to make sure we're getting the best value with that they are providing the best service uh, within our budget. So I just wanted to make that clarification. Okay, thank you, and I appreciate staff's due diligence, and I'm, I'm sure you know what to look for. I personally, and these are my personal views, think that the 83% compared to the 82% isn't enough to sway me for saving 23,000. All right, duly noted. Uh, with that, I'm gonna make a motion to approve this item 10.7. Can we get a second, please? I'll second. All right. Mayor Pro, Pen uh, sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Carwin. Aye. Council Member Dinez. Aye. Council Member Estrada. Nay. Council Member Sobeck? Aye. Mayor Zimmerman? Aye. All right, so that passes four to one with Councilman Estrada dissenting. We will now move to our next item. This is 10 point, if I'm right, 10.12, uh, pulled by Council Member Sobeck. 10.12 is, as we go forward in our agenda and take a look, it's an MOU with the uh, cupboard. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and I see that we have Don here from the community covered. Uh, thank you, Corey, for this report. I just have a few questions in sure. regarding to this MOU. I know this is by Cal Recyclable, and, and this is something that we need to do to um, oh, follow this California state mandates. So um, one of the things that this grant will do will ex uh, give expansion of food repacking and sort storage space at the primary facility of the Menifee Valley Community Cupboard. It will help to purchase, are these are, I guess these are possibilities. Purchase a refrigerator, a refrigerated box truck to be used for donation pickup and satellite food distributions. Purchase of a refrigerator box truck to be used for donation pickups at the satellite food 
distribution sites of Quail Valley Boys and Girls Club, which, do we have a Quail Valley Boys and Girls Club? Or is it just Menifee's? It, it's, right now it's temporarily um, vacated. Okay, that's what I thought. Valley. Okay, so that was a question. And then near Heritage High School in Roma Land. So I, I'm happy to see that we're being able to reach all of our city. But um, I just want to know, um, does this grant, well, I guess I should ask the first question. Will you need extra employees to handle this extra equipment? And if so, does the grant cover that need for the Menifee cupboard? Yes, thank you. Good, uh, good evening. So uh, just highlighted on the presentation, but the uh, items listed are actually approved under the grant. So they're all part of the project that we jointly submitted to the grant program for approval. So um, all of those items are funded um, based on the estimates that we provided to the um, to Cal Recycle. So uh, for the expanded distribution, um, and if you valid community covered, um, has agreed to hire uh, one driver, I believe, and I can ask Dawn to come up if she wants to elaborate on that, um, to operate the uh, additional distribution truck, collection and distribution truck. Okay. And we'll, you know, this is just so confusing and so new. Um, can you share a little bit of the process and what food they're getting from restaurants and how they're gonna be repackaged, or how do they choose which food um, to distribute? Luckily, we have Dawn here. I think I'll pass that on to her. <laughs> so we don't get the wrong information. Good evening, council members. It's a very good question because we are still learning about packaging. One of the things that we wanted to be prepared for is donations from restaurants. We still really don't 100% know what those are gonna look like, but we are reaching out to other food pantries that have done repackaging of food. This, is, this would be where someone gives us a bulk donation and we break it down and we have to meet certain health uh, environmental health requirements. So part of this was to allow us to be sure we would be in compliant with them when we get to that point. The, um, what we're really starting out with is the, the, the truck, which will allow us to pick up food, hold that food, um, and take it to satellite donations. That's the primary focus that we're we're planning on. Yes, it did include a driver so that we would have an additional driver for that project and we will, uh, we are and will be um, trying to recruit volunteers. Um, I'm speaking to the whole city right now. Uh, volunteers to help us with that processing and we do have um, an agreement with the Boys and Girls Club to use their Quell Valley site. We also um, have the, uh, the very, very excited cooperation of the Paris Union High School District um, who are going to let us use uh, part of their parking facility near their stadium for the distribution. So that's what we're really focused on and we're still learning about what pre packaging means and we're still going to be learning what the restaurants are going to be giving us because well-managed restaurants rarely have usable food to give us. So um, that would that I'm looking at that as sort of a secondary, but we want to be prepared when they do. If they hand us a 50-pound bag of rice, it's getting too close to its use-by date. Um, we have to have the ability to repackage it in accordance with environmental help. So I hope that answers your question. It does, and I appreciate that because I know the work, this, you do great work in the city of Menifee and provide a lot of meals the Menifee Community Cover does. Um, as a side note, am I allowed to ask about the backpack program and if they still do that? It's not in this, is that part of this where the That's food could be used? That's not specifically reused? part of it, but the answer is yes, we are still doing the backpack program. Um, little footnote, the schools don't like the backpack itself, so it's just a food bag that we are delivering. Uh, primarily, we have about 80 families with the Menifee School District, and we have a smaller number, about 20 or so, at the Romaland School District. Um, we are still delivering every single week uh, to their liaisons to distribute to the families that are in crisis. Okay, so you'll be able to provide more food uh, once we get this up. Uh, and I appreciate the partnership the city is doing with the Menifee Community Covered. You're just a great resource in our city. So if anybody is out there looking for a volunteer opportunity, contact Don. May so. I add one thing? One of the things we've always looked for the satellite is because we know that it's hard for them, the families, the hardest uh, low-income families in Romaland and Quail Valley, 
which is why those sites are chosen. Okay, and that reminded me, um, on the Boys and Girls Club site, it, they're not using it, so they're gonna be allowing you to use that site. Okay, great. Um, so I'll, I'll move to approve if there aren't any more questions. All right, we have a motion by Council Member Sobeck and a second from Mayor Pro Tem Carwin. Council Member Dinez? Aye. Council Member Estrada? Aye. Council Member Sobeck? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Carwin? Aye. And Mayor Zimmerman? Aye. So that passes unanimously. We'll come to our final polled item. It's pulled by me. It was 10. Point one four, and I see Ms. Kittrell coming, thank you. Um, mine is a simple question. I don't think we need a staff report, but I just wanted to ask you, tonight's action is approving a final map and also approving the faithful performance bond, but the performance bond is just to guarantee completion of some of the required improvements associated with the project, and the final map part isn't actually that we're approving the project tonight, this has already been approved, and can you just tell us that information, when it was approved, um, and when it was vetted, and who did the approving? C certainly, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, the project uh, before you, you're correct, the final map and subdivision improvements is really the culmination of uh, many years of work. The original project was submitted to the planning department in 2015. We did our project analysis, environmental review, and presented the project at a public hearing to the planning commission in May of 2018. At that time, um, the project did require city council review and approval. So so at another public hearing in June of 2018, the council approved the project formally. Okay, very good, thank you. I just wanna make it clear so that anyone seeing doesn't think that today, February 1st on 2023, we <clears throat> approved a housing project. This was approved prior to any of us, except for council member Sobeck, I think is the only one that was here back then. So anyway, with that, I'm gonna thank you for the thank update you. and I'll move approval uh, of this item. Can I get a second, please? Second. Okay. Councilmember Estrada? Aye. Councilmember Sobeck? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Carwin? Aye. Councilmember Dinez? Aye. Mayor Zimmerman? Aye. So that passes unanimously, and thank you, everybody. We're now moving ahead to uh, item 11 is our public hearing items. I see that there's none, so we'll go to item 12, discussion. And our item 12.1 is a discussion item regarding waste management senior bill assistance program review. And I see Ms. Jones heading to the podium, so welcome. Good evening. I was going to do the have a presentation. Okay, there we are. Okay, so the um, we, so SB 1383, um, as we know by now, requires residents to separate their food scraps include, and their yard waste, um, which is considered organic waste, into their green bin. California doesn't currently offer any waivers or any sort of um, exemption for residential generators. Um, and Menifee's residential organic waste is currently being transported and processed at the waste management compost facility in Tulare. Uh, so, oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, this year, or last year, I should say, uh, Waste Management agreed to phase in the cost associated with SB 1383, which is roughly $2.24 a month per uh, customer over three years on accounts with 64-gallon um, bins, which are the smaller carts um, that you, uh, smaller than the typical carts you would see in the front of a home, the 96-gallon uh, cart. Um, and those homes will have what's known as a senior rate. So um, those, that price increase is phased in over three years. In addition to that, to help offset the increase to the senior community, um, as part of mid-year budget, council approved, um, mid-year 2021-22, sorry, approved a one-time $50 bill credit um, for seniors 60 and up. So the total program funded was 150,000, um, which came from general fund offset by um, an annual payment that the city receives um, each year an amount of $300,000 from waste management, which is specifically to support salt waste and recycling programs. So just to be clear, the funding did not come from the franchise fee um, revenue. 
Okay, and to apply for the program, uh, seniors can bring a copy of their ID and waste management bill to the community services office on the KC Center campus or email it to waste underscore recycle at cityofminifee.us. So to date, the program has approved um, a little over 2,600 bill credits, which amounts to $132,250. So remaining on that program is um, uh, a little bit over uh, under 18,000. Um, so we're estimating that Menifee has uh, 3,000 additional senior residents that can, um, that have not yet applied for the credit. This also includes um, a little over 1,500 HOA residences that are actually required to add service prior to the end of the year. And uh, so the request is um, for a discussion of the program and to provide guidance to staff. All right, thank you, Ms. Jones. Um, I do have a quick question. The source of the money that we used in the past to uh, create this program, was it from our general fund or did we have a grant that we used money passed through? It, it, a general fund mm -hmm. offset by the one-time $300,000 program fee that we receive, which also goes into general fund, but we receive that each year from waste management. Okay, and so, we're going to be discussing this eventually, and one of the questions that we'll have is, should we continue the program and maybe add more funds? What would the source of funds be if we were to do that? General fund, or do we have more grant, new grant money from the state? Mayor, if I can yes. um, interject. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, if the council wishes the um, city staff to explore uh, expanding the program, we can bring back some options on funding that. One source could be using these program funds that uh, we're currently getting from waste management that's currently funding the assistance we're providing now. Okay, thank you. So we don't really know exactly where the money might come from. That would have to come back to us, is that what you're saying? Yeah, that would have to come back as a budget allocation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Carwin's got a question. It's making my head spin a little bit with the funding issue. I am I hearing it right that the state is increasing the rate and we're getting a grant from WM that we're using to fund our residents to pay that increase in rate to the state? Is that where this circle is coming from? That's a good interpretation, but yes, the state has required these services to take place, which um, in turn raises rates on the hauler and the, and the, and the customer, so. Okay, so the the grant that we approve, remind me on the language, is that a, a permanent credit, meaning they get the $50, or does it terminate at the end of the year if they don't use it all by the end of the year? Because my, my calculation, the increase is about two twenty four dollars a month, which is $26 a year. If they get a $50 credit, that would cover two years of the increase. Correct, yes, it's a one-time $50. It's one time, but it stays on there until it's utilized. Uh, it typically would be used within a month just because, or I'm sorry, your quarterly bill. I think the rate right now is like $96, so it would probably cover half of, half of that. But yeah, it would essentially, I think, if you look at it of like what we're recovering um, as far as the increase, it would be like the first two years, yeah. Right, so that's, that, was my, that was my question, because the purpose of this program was to cover the increase, not somebody's full trash right, bill. correct. So the increase is about 224 a month, based on SB 1383. The credit of $50 would cover the next, would cover two years of the increase. It doesn't, it doesn't terminate at the end of the year, right? right. It stays on the bill. Okay. Maybe I don't understand the question. They get the fifty dollars one time. Correct. And that that credit doesn't expire. No, no, it doesn't expire. Okay. So is the all right, I think we're getting I, I I understand now. So yeah, it covers two years of the increase by giving them fifty dollars. That's okay. That's an you. offset. Right. All right, thank you. But it'll be gone in a couple of months because the $50 just gets applied to the total bill, not just the increase. Right, So we can, we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail in okay. the discussion section. Any other questions, council members? All right, hearing, oh, I'm I'll sorry, take, go I'll, ahead. Quick question here. Um, you said there's an additional 3,000 residents that would qualify for this that haven't uh, applied. Um, 
Are we receiving any more applications at this time, or? It's trickled down, uh, trickled off a little bit um, since we initially um, released the program. Um, I think this month alone, we've probably only received like 17 applications. We haven't um, uh, put any posts out on social media or anything, but um, it's definitely trickled down as far as applications. So I guess the question, can we reach the other 3,000 somehow and see if there's interest there uh, for the, re the balance of the money? And then, um, so if we continue it, then we would just al allow the residents who already had done once to reapply again. Is that the idea? Continue if that's the on. direction of council. Okay, that's my question to have. All right, hearing no other questions, uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any correspondence on this item? Is that in our red folder? We do. We have okay. one email in your red folder. Excellent, thank you. And then do we have any requests to speak tonight on this item? We do not. All right, thank you. Um, at that point, council members, we can open it up for discussion. Uh, I kind of like the idea of um, just concluding the program once these funds are expended. I think that um, the point was to soften the blow of the increase and I think it's done that. We've had 2,645 people served already and uh, we've got 355 more. Um, and so I think that that, I think we've done what we can and um, personally, just my th opinion, council members is, uh, I think we ought to just let it run its course. So, but I'd like to hear your thoughts too. Uh, Mayor, I have a question. Um, Art Marquez, our representative from Waste Manage Management, had mentioned that this year our city was going to receive more grant funding from the state for this program. Have we, do we know if, is it more? Have we received it? Do you know anything, Corey? I have heard of a second round of a local assistance grant, but I, I don't think anything says, has been released as far as applying for that. So I'm not, I'm not totally, uh, share what Art was referring to. Let me ask you a question. If that does come to fruition and the state suddenly has that, would you be, are you suggesting that maybe we reconsider this at that time? I, I think that that might be a good idea. Okay. So okay. maybe we give direction and if you guys agree with this to let it, uh, let the funds be exhausted and should the state have something for us, you could bring it to us and we could consider, uh, having a second round. One thing that I do want to point out um, is that the, local, the first local assistance grant, um, we were unable to use um, those funds for incentive programs. Mm. So this would not be, that's why this came out of a general fund um, project because uh, the local assistant grant that we received originally wasn't going to allow So this. if it's not allowed, then scratch everything I just said. Right. <laughs> I didn't yeah. realize that, thank you. All right, go ahead, Bob. Yeah. So. When I brought this forward originally, it was intended to assist people in the sudden onput of the increase. People are already paying the rate. It wasn't to help them cover the cost of their trash service. It was that I thought this was an absurd bill that got passed that for people on fixed income would add. It's a small amount, but all those things make a difference. And it's so, so it would create a buffer like we were talking about. And this creates a two year buffer, which is, which is excellent. Um, I, I wouldn't be in favor of renewing it because having it go ad infinitum isn't the purpose of it. We're not here just to pay people's bills for them. We're here to help them so they don't struggle when we can with the grant money. Um, I am, compelled by the, the, the statistic that there's about 1,500 HOA residences that are going to be added to the SB 1383 program, which is about half of the amount of people who have already applied. So what I, what I would like to see is an extension of the program maybe by half, because that's the amount of new residences that are coming online and leave it open to new applicants. So not a renewal. If you've already received the grant that you're covered for two years and that's you're going to have that taken care of for you, that increase, new people coming online, there's about half of those estimated. So we do that. And I don't know if legally, if we could build in a reimbursement to our general fund if a grant becomes available to reimburse us for putting out the expenditure up front. Uh 
again, we, we couldn't use the funding the first time for an incentive program, and I definitely asked. Um, so we well, could, I guess, if, forget that specific program, but if a grant it becomes available that would apply to this, would we be able to reimburse ourselves for the upfront addition to the general fund, to the, to the program? Typically, grants won't reimburse you for past expenses, but in theory, yeah. Probably. So, I mean, what I what I would like to see—it's been such a successful program with these new with new residences that are coming into experiencing the increase. Ideally, what I would like to see is extending it for one more year at half of the size of the program, leaving it open to new applicants only. Um, that's that's what I would that's what I would like to see instead of just terminating it at this point and trying to revisit it after it maybe becomes a problem. All right, thank you. Uh, Councilman Dinas. A question for you on the uh, HOAs. A lot of them have, you know, are d the HOA pays the dues, the, the fees, not individual um, homeowners, or they have a, a common collection area and then waste manager comes in and t dumps it in the big trash bin things. How does how would something like that, how would this program work on, on a program like that? Do we just give you know, $50 for everybody that lives in the, within the HOA? Is that how that's supposed to work? Typically, that's how we've done it. Yes, if it's um, uh, like one master account, we'll just um, uh, provide the credit based on the number of single family residences in the community. Has any HOAs been applied for this and received funding? Yes, we were, uh, we've uh, issued credits to. Uh, okay, so the HOAs. when you say that there's 1,500 HOA residents that are required to add the services, they've already they've, they've they've been required to do that from the beginning, like the individuals, right? So these aren't 1,500 new people waiting to be charged the extra two dollars and twenty four cents a month. <laughs> if I understand the question correctly, so the 1,500 um, outstanding HOA communities do not currently have services. Um, and so that's something that we're working with waste management to try to reconcile, but they will need to add organic service at some point during the year based on the um, state mandate. So, so, so they could apply. Those would be the HOAs that haven't. They don't have green service, don't okay. have organic service, sorry. Okay. Okay, thank you. Any more discussion, council members? At some point, we need to try to get everyone's opinion on this. Now, I have suggested that we continue uh, until the funds are exhausted and end the program. Council member Carwin has suggested we extend it and add some more funds, correct? I'd like to hear from council member Sobeck, Dinas, and Estrada on this item, and hopefully we can come to some uh, idea so of how we feel. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to come. I would like to have this come back after we receive the second round of grants to see what it can be used for. Okay, so I'm going to have got a third thing here well, now. Well, and it kind of it kind of <laughs> goes along with your recommendation as well. Yeah, mine is to so continue it until the funds are exhausted. To continue it till it's exhausted, but also look at the new opportunity because for me, talking with waste management. Um, Art Marquez, I believe, and I don't want to put him on the spot, but he was, he was really um, praising our city for doing this, and I believe he was thinking we were using the grant money. So I would like to get some clarification on this because that's what I believe he assumed is we were using the grant money, and he said of all the other cities, no one else had done this for their residents. <laughs> And he was very impressed with the decision our city council made. So, Corey, it, did we use grant money from waste management on to to provide this program? We don't receive grants from waste management, but we did. Oh, from, right, and we and we this. did not use the local assistance grant for this program. All right, and Mr. Nix, did you have something to share? Uh, yeah, I was just going to clarify that. Um, the grant we received is one that we just presented uh, in partnership with uh, Menifee Valley Cupboard um, to purchase those items. And so um, uh, I think um, Mr. Marquez uh, did applaud the city because we were um, only one of two cities in the entire state to receive that grant. So it's a very good effort by the city. But then we're also one of the few cities, I, I actually haven't heard of another city that went the extra mile like this city council did to provide this assistance to our seniors. Okay. 
So maybe there's just maybe we're, maybe we just need to try to understand that Mr. Marquez might have been talking about the food recovery program. Is that right? That was what he. I, I think we need some clarification. Okay. All right. I still want to hear from Councilman Dinas and from yep. Councilman Estrada. Would do you prefer? I, I would. I would agree with you, Mayor, that we've we put this to to, uh, to ease our seniors into for the first two years of this increase. I think it's a, it was a one-time money. It was a one-time program, and it's something that we would probably should uh, stick with what our original plan was. Okay. Uh, out of fairness, though, it, otherwise we could find other residents that could use assistance too. And, um, and this, you know, we don't want to be in, we, the city can't afford to be ongoing type of assistance for one segment when there's other seg segments of the community that could use it as well. Okay, excellent. And Councilman Estrada. Yeah, I think the root of the dilemma is when you give someone something and now we're going to be taking it away, you know, if we don't have the money, we don't have the money. And I agree with uh, the mayor and Councilman Dinas, we should let it expire. And hopefully we helped residents in the in the meantime. All right, very good. I think we do have a consensus of the council. Um, I do want to uh, respect Council Member Sobeck's suggestion that should a grant come about something new we weren't expecting and suddenly we are able to use pass-through funds, that it could come back to us at that future time. But in the meantime, if not, We'll go ahead and uh, conclude the program once our funds are exhausted, right? Everybody agree? I think we have direction. Uh, Mr. Melching, do we need to do anything more, votes or anything, or are we given enough direction? No, the program is going to end on its own um, without a vote. So. All right, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Appreciate it. Let's move on. Uh, we are now on our final item uh, for discussion. This is 12.2, consideration of change to the governance structure. And I see Rebecca Kramer is here. Welcome, Ms. Kramer. Thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. It's always a pleasure to be with you. The item presented uh, for discussion this evening is a possible change in the city's governance structure shifting from what we currently have, with, which uh, includes four council districts and an at-large elected mayor, to five council districts with the mayor uh, selected from amongst the members of the city council. If I could, um, our presentation. Thank you. So uh, just to give a, a quick overview, um, the existing structure that is in place was established by voters in November of 2010. Um, and then in subsequent elections, uh, the uh, electorate has um, uh, approved several changes uh, to the mayor's term of office, as well as compensation provided to the mayor. Should the city council uh, decide to initiate a ballot initiative uh, for voter consideration, funding will uh, be required uh, to be allocated for both the election and a redistricting process. So uh, the combined election and uh, redistricting costs are projected to be close to $100,000 uh, if the measure is consolidated with one of the city's general municipal elections. And then uh, just a, a couple of other points we wanted to review with you this evening. Uh, if the measure is uh, placed on a ballot as part of the next general municipal election, which would be November of 2024, um, those changes would go into effect in December of 2028. And then um, uh, the other thing that uh, we did want to share with you is our electorate did consider a ballot measure in November of 2018 uh, for a similar provision to have five districts with uh, the uh, uh, mayor elected at large, that office to be eliminated and uh, the mayor to, to be selected from amongst the members of the city council. That measure, uh, measure I, uh, did not pass. Um, and so we are left with our, our current governance structure that's in place. 
So if the uh, council so desires to move forward, we can certainly do so. We would need to bring back uh, draft documents for your consideration. We will at that time provide you with a much more detailed analysis in terms of the options that are available to you, the costs, the timeline for the election, et cetera. But we wanted to bring this forward for discussion this evening to uh, get your input before staff moves forward with um, expending resources um, along those lines. So with that, I would certainly welcome any questions that you may have. Ms. Kramer, thank you for the introduction. And council members, uh, questions at this time? Do we have any questions for Ms. Kramer? I don't hear any, so uh, thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, did we receive any correspondence on this item? Yes, in your red folder. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I could just tell you were going to say that. Um, do we have any requests to speak on this item? I do not at this okay. time. Okay, no public comments. All right, so with that, uh, council members, it's open for discussion. Um, I think that if I recall right, this was added to our agenda by Councilman Carwin and seconded by Council Member Sobeck, so I'm sure that maybe you guys both have uh, some input, but I'm going to follow who's in the queue first, and it's Councilman. I'll, I'll be happy to, to allow to defer. The, the All right, so we'll Councilman Carwin, go, maybe you can um, have the floor first. Thank you. I want to preface my comments by saying that my request to add this to the agenda was absolutely in no way a reflection of our current mayor. Um, I appreciate this, the, what you've done in crafting the culture of our of our city. You've, I I think you've done an incredible job of bringing the ship to to sail and. Uh, setting us in the right direction. What I'm more looking forward to is down the road 10, 15, 20 years. I, I personally, I, when, I, when I go to Cal Cities and all these different places where we meet with other elected officials from cities around California, they all ask me why we have an outlarge mayor because we have a city manager. And in, there's a, a charter city concept where the mayor is the chief executive, such as in the city of Los Angeles, the city of Menifee, the mayor is not the chief executive, but m making the mayor an at-large position elected by the city as a whole creates an impression that the mayor is the chief executive and somebody who is not as, uh, uh, let's say, morally sound as our current mayor may take advantage of that perception in, uh, in, in different ways. I'm concerned that once we get to a build-out population in 10 years or however long that's projected of 150 or 160,000 residents, for one person to have to campaign for the entire 49 and a half square miles of 150,000 residents, we're talking about six figures. We're talking about $100,000. And if, if you have a contested campaign where there are three or four active candidates, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars being spent to campaign for a job that's basically a volunteer position. And you have to wonder where that money is going to come from. Um, whereas if you are elected by a district and campaigning in a district, your focus on election is within that district. You serve the whole city, and you're concerned with the residents of the city, and you, you serve those residents no matter where they live within our boundary. But the campaigning, the stuff that people spend money on and take donations from and owe favors because of, potentially, um, is limited when you have districts, as opposed to being completely at large. And I'm concerned that we might have somebody who comes in with a huge bank roll and isn't working in the best interest of the city uh, down the line. It would help us police that because we would have a one-year term. If somebody's doing a great job, great. You can elect them to a second term or rotate out. It's by virtue of the fact that we've got a city manager, having an at-large mayor in four districts just doesn't match up. And the final point that I'll make is what that's going to do once the city becomes its full size with the, all the different activities and development and input, the burden just mentally and physically on the person who sits in an at-large mayor seat under those uh, impressions is going to be immense. I mean, I, I, I bring up Neil Winner in his position. He took that upon himself, and, and he perished from it. Um, I, I see that as something that can be very draining. And then if somebody doesn't 
do it to the capacity that you've been able to miraculously, are they looked down upon? It, it just creates this psychological um, burden for the person who sits in that seat that's unfair and really shouldn't be thrust upon them. You know, the, the, the public, I fear that the public was not fully educated on the role of the mayor when we had the last, the last times where it's come on the ballot. Um, so all of that being said, that's the, all of those are the reasons that I brought it forward. Um, I am concerned with the duplicative nature of having just redistricted and then asking us to redo it again three months later seems absurd. I wish I'd thought of it sooner, but I wasn't on the city council then before the last election. So it would have been nice, but I don't think I was able to, to, to bring it forward in that capacity. And something like this is well into the future. You know, like I said, it wouldn't be instituted until 2028. So it's, we're, we are forward looking, much like we talked about the Marietta Road Bridge, how we lay the groundwork now for something in the future. Um, I don't think that $100,000 to correct what I think is an error in our government structure is a hugely burdensome fee. Um, you know, if you, if you hire a plumber and they do a terrible job, you've got to hire another plumber. Um, and I think that's kind of where we're at. We hired, a, we hired a plumber who is not very skilled at building a government, and now we have to hire another one. But that's, those are the reasons that I brought it up. And if the, if the public was behind this idea, I don't think that the cost that we're talking about is something that's going to make or break the city, and it would create a benefit well into the future for the way our government. Every, and if you look at every city around us, Murrieta, Temecula, they all do it that way. We're the only ones who have the at-large mayor from all of the, the cities around us. And uh, there's a reason for that, that they do it that way. And how we started out that way as well. Remember that, that when we were incorporated, we did have a rotating mayor position. So it was kind of intended with the incorporation. So I apologize for going on and on and on, but it's a big issue. And that's taking it through the reasons that I brought it up and why I think it's a good idea. All right, thank you, and you delivered that very well. All right, Councilman Dinas. Thank you. Um, you know, when, when this last was in 2018, it was on Major IJM, whatever it was called. It was a time I was out knocking on doors. And uh, I got a lot of earful about these measures when I was knocking on doors because they, the public, our residents, our voters, liked the way it was. And they like having a mayor at large. That gave them two voices on the council where they voted for. Um, I, I, I keep going back that the residents voted twice to have this particular form of government for their city. Um, whether, you know, the part where they, where they don't know if they, you know, understood it well enough or not, they understood it well enough to know that they know what they wanted. You know, if, this, if we had people, our residents were saying, hey, we want to change, that's one thing. If we had a grassroots initiative, um, I could see that. But the residents are happy with the way they are, the way it is. And that, I've, I was told that straight up. And, I, you know, nothing's changed in, from our residents that I've heard or seen to want to change it and go put out and spend 100000 plus just to do a, to change a ballot initiative and then have to do another, then go out and then, then do another election for another council member. Um, I, I think it's unnecessary and I think it's going against what, their, what our residents had asked for twice now. All right, very good point. Uh, other council members have anything they want to share on the topic? Council member Sobeck. You know, I just, I just feel that there's a lack of understanding with our residents. The, the, a lot of big key cities around us that do the rotating mayor know that those residents know they have a mayor representing them each year. And um, we, do, you know, we do have a city manager that runs the city. Um, I just believe that it's just, just a lack of information, a lack of knowledge, how it works. I do, as Carwin said, looking into the future, um, five districts would be really nice, where, you, 
where everyone on the council would have a district that they represent and you rotate that mayor position depending on the vote of the council each year. Also talking with um, mayors in other cities where they do the rotation, um, I've heard many serving on committees that they look forward to that end of the year where they can pass that torch and give that opportunity to someone else on their council. So um, again, with Carwin, what he said, the cost, that, that concerns me. Um, I just believe that there might be some education that needs to be done and, uh, to let our residents know that we do have a city manager. And as we learned in the last city council meeting, um, we all have the same vote. We all have one vote. The mayor's position is ceremonial. Um, it is a volunteer position. And I think sometimes um, just our residents don't understand how our form of government works. So. All right, very good. Uh, Councilman Estrada, did you want to share any thoughts? Yes, there were a lot of topics touched on, but ultimately I trust the voters. The voters have spoken, and I'll leave it at that. All right, very good. And, and I agree with pretty much all of the sentiments. They're, they're all correct, both sides. Um, but I think we need to re be reminded sometimes that structure of having five council members and rotating it can cause some division and problems. I've seen it in a neighboring city where it was someone's turn next and a couple of them wanted to stick it to them and got together and bypassed them and drove a wedge into that city and it was a real real nightmare. So some, sometimes there's good and bad in it. Uh, continuity of having people know who the mayor is and having the mayor, it's four years. That go, you Look how quickly four years goes by. Um, and there's an opportunity for a new mayor to step up uh, after that fourth year. So um, to me, you know, I kind of like it the way it is. I hate to ask the voters the same question after they've already given direction at the ballot box and reaffirmed it again in 2018. To ask again seems disrespectful. And... Um, I liked, I, I can't, I, I think it was Councilman Dinas who said that if this is something that this council should move forward with, it should be by an initiative, a petition from the voters. If, if it's a couple of council members that want it, okay, fine. But if there's a correct number of voters that say this is important to us voters, please put it on the ballot. Hey. As uh, Councilman Estrada said, we respect the voters, and if and if they go through the petition process, grassroots, I think was the word you used. I agree with that 100%. Um, so that's my personal opinion. I think we should leave it alone. And if the voters are feeling like they're not getting something they want, they should bring that to us. Um, that's my opinion. So, Mayor, I have a question on that, and. Maybe Rebecca can answer this. So I do remember when this came forward as a grassroots from a couple of residents who wanted to put the initiative on the ballot to change our initial charter from a rotating mayor to elected mayor at large. Um, when that happens, who pays for that? So the city will cover, is required to cover the cost. So if, if we have enough signatures, so the proponent must uh, uh, advise the city that they intend uh, to uh, collect signatures for a ballot initiative, um, we are required, or they are required to get 10% of the registered voters uh, as certified um, by the registrar of voters. <clears throat> So once they get the required number of signatures, uh, the city would uh, be required to cover the cost of the initiative itself, so the placement on uh, the ballot for the election, um, as well as the fact that we would be required to cover the cost of uh, certification or verification of signatures, which is uh, 50 cents uh, per signature. Wow. Okay, thank you very much yeah. for answering that. And Councilman Carwin? 
Yeah, I, I was just looking back to, to remember. I, I did bring this up as a future agenda item before the last election, so it's not like a sour grapes thing or anything like that. Uh, I did bring it up in September of last year. Again, not soon enough to avoid all the, the duplicate effort. And I'm not interested in burdening our taxpayers with paying for all of these things again to get this done right now. One of the reasons I wanted it as a future agenda item is for Rebecca to be able to tell us what it would cost, what it would entail, and what the process is for that so we can start the conversation. And if it's a conversation that the people don't want to have, I'll, I'll drop it because we're here at the pleasure of the people. I'm not looking to, to force anything on our residents, but I just wanted to kind of get the information out there and, and these costs and things like that. I, I really appreciate Rebecca bringing that for us and, and educating me on what it, the process is. And um, I, I really look forward to, to receiving maybe some input from the public. Having had this item heard at a, a full city council meeting on, on their thoughts, and if everybody says that I'm way off base, then then so be it. it. You know, it wouldn't benefit me at all personally, or any any of us personally to do it, so it's not a, a, a personal uh, a benefit for me to do this. There's no incentive, but um, I'm just looking out for the future of the city, so maybe down the line if things change, so be it, but I'm not looking to, to force this issue. I just wanted it to, to be fully fleshed out and maybe a discussion started. All right, I'm glad you said that too. Any other uh, comments, council members? It sounds to me like um, the consensus is just to table the item. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Ms. Kramer, and thank you, council members. All right, let's move on now. We are on item 13. This is our city attorney. Do you have anything to report to us? No, Mayor. Nothing, all right. And then our assistant city manager, Ms. Clayton, do you have anything for us tonight? Good evening. No, I have nothing to report, but I would like to take this time to uh, congratulate Jonathan Nix on his promotion to deputy city manager. Uh, he has served as the city's community services director for the past five years, and interim public works director while serving in that role and a lot of other <laughs> special assignments and just want to take this time to congratulate him. I think we should give him a hand. <laughs> all right, very good. And let's all wish uh, our city manager the best. I know he's under the weather, so hopefully we'll see him back in action real soon. All right, um, and with that, um, I'm just going to extend it. Jonathan, did you want to share any thoughts or uh, let us know kind of what you have in mind? Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Yeah. Yes, definitely uh, very much appreciate um, the five years that I've been working with the city and working with your council members and um, now working with Council Member Estrada and looking to continue to serve the community, both in community services, but also internally and service our employees where we're seeing human resources and some other functions with the city. So really glad to continue to be here. Awesome. Congratulations, Jonathan. All right. Um, council members, we're on item 15 now. Future agenda requests. Do we have anything we'd like to add to a future agenda? Hearing none, we are adjourned and it is now 816. So thank you, everybody. Appreciate everyone who stayed to the end. <laughs>